Good evening, everyone, and welcome to DIA. My name is Mathilde Guidelli. I'm a curator here and the organizer of the Artists on Artists lecture series, where since 2001, we invite an artist to reflect upon the work of another artist in DIA's collection and past program. And we are very excited for tonight's event featuring Jonatas de Andrade on Soli Wit. The um, purpose of the series is to foster dialogue among artists from different generations and points of view. And it is always exciting for us to see who the artist will choose. We never prescribe the artist. And um, there is a word, working with Jonatas, there is a word in, art, in Western art history called pseudomorphism, which literally means false form. And often these talks reveal a pseudomorphism between a formal affinity between two artists, even if the origin of their form is very distant. And Jonathan's talk tonight precisely interrogates the question of formal resonance and further opens up the dialogue by introducing a third interlocutor, the Kayapo women and their drawing practice. So before passing it on to Umberto, who will introduce Jonathan, we wish to thank everyone at DIA who helped make tonight possible, in particular, Kim Golding, Max Tannon, Emily Markert, Liv Cuniberti, Davida Nayamaya, and the Visitor Service team, as well as uh, Daniel Rosler and Aria Rosler Gallery for their generosity, Alexander Boni for their help coordinating with Jonathan, and uh, Paula Cooper Gallery for their help with sourcing uh, images of Lewitt's work. Thank you, Matilde. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Humberto Moro, and I'm Deputy Director of Programs here at DIA. And it is my absolute honor to introduce Jonathan de Andrade. He was born in Maceió in 1982, and he lives in the north of Brazil in Recife, uh, a coastal city that is rich in contrast, where all buildings nestle among, amongst modern skyscrapers and where the failure of tropical modernist utopia is tangible. Through the languages of conceptual art, photography, film, Jonatas creates rigorous and compelling arguments to understand the political complexities of human relationships to notions like progress, modernity, inequality, and desire. In the many mediums that Jonathan, Jonathan has explored, there is an overarching sense of intimacy and generosity. And it is precisely in this sense of generosity that Jonathan reveals a myriad of interconnections between the natural and built environments, uh, where we are able to see possibilities to relate to all problems in new forms. I remember very vividly when I first saw one of his most iconic works, uh, the film Opeche, or The Fish, where he captures a ritualistic embracing of a fish uh, in his passage from life to death, in what the artist describes as the utopian dream of a harmonious community with its surroundings as a testament to the lack of connection between a man from the city and the nature that is at his service. The relationship to land and the tension between rural spaces and industrial modernity are ideas that exist at the core of DIA. And we're thrilled to keep expanding this research with global relevant voices from the South, such as Jonathan's. Among, the, among his many accolades, Jonathan represented Brazil in the 59th Bi Venice Biennial in 2022 with the installation title With the Heart Coming Out of the Mouth, a sort of to total work of art that employed language as an embodied metaphor to address the possibility of plurality within deep states of inequality. Jonathan has also participated in many biennials like Sharjah, Seoul Media City, Lyon, Istanbul, Mercosul, Guangzhou, and Sao Paulo. He has had solo exhibitions at the Pinacoteca and Maspi Museum in Sao Paulo, the MCA Chicago, the Power Plant in Toronto, Matt and Kunzale Lisbon in Lisboa, and the New Museum in New York, just to mention a few. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Jonathan de Andrade. Well, well, thank you very much, Humberto and Matilde. I was pretty intrigued by this invitation uh, to oversee Dia's collection on minimalism and uh, conceptual art. 
as I don't see my work exactly as minimal, but <laughs> but I was uh, caught by Louis's ideas, and I want to share a little bit of this journey with you. And I'll start sharing um, a, a few of his quotes on of the book Sentences on Conceptual Art from '69. So. The artist may construct the piece. However, the piece may be fabricated. Ideas alone can be works of art. They are in a chain of development that may eventually find some form. The ideas need not to be complex. Most ideas that are successful are ludicrously simple. The artist may not necessarily understand his own art. His perception is neither better nor worse than that of others. So um, some of, of Lewitt's conceptual ideas and, uh, and principles look to me as a territory full of possibilities. And uh, the idea of having a starting point or a, a device or a rule or a proposition uh, for me, it's uh, super powerful, the idea that it can motivate a group, a meeting of people. And this meeting can come up with experimenting an instruction that can become to materiality. Uh, the idea of the, that the work and its manifestation can happen one or, or more times, and the essence of the work through the idea is something that can be kept also uh, emphasizes the idea of a process where the decisions, the interpretations, the, the proposition in, in, in real life can create uh, an element of e ephemerality and also an aspect of chance. The idea of, uh, of collaboration and authorship is also something that it's complexified. And uh, if the proposition is the trigger of the work, uh, it, it's also, sometimes it's, uh, uh, it's not also the, the authorship exactly. The authorship can be the expanded in, in the collaboration of so, of the so many people that make that proposition happen. For me, in my work, uh, I, I work a lot collaboratively. I do propositions to people, to groups of people. I, this happens in many of my films, like O Peixe, like uh, Jogos Dirigidos, uh, like uh, Olho da Rua. And, uh, and I like understanding the, looking at Lewitt's ideas, I like the, the idea that the proposition and destruction is a sort of kind of, it's a kind of a game with the participants, but also not only in the process, but also in, with the relation with the audience, when in a museum, when the final piece is at, is at the museum. The magic of, uh, of this proposition or this uh, instruction being taken alive and its variations uh, brings an element of a chance. And uh, the drawing or the sculpture or the installation or the artwork that can be a film, or a photography, uh, an installation, uh, for me, it's, it's a, a sort of a document of that process that touches not only the real, but also the fictional. There is a dynamic of a fiction that is completed by the interpretation of those who see the work. And uh, looking at Lewitt's work, it made me look again at uh, the drawings by Kayapo women, the indigenous community in South Pará, in the Amazon, and uh, their use of lines, patterns, and the, somehow there, are, there is a resonation with, uh, with Lewitt's drawings, but also different motivations. The paintings of the Kaipo women, they are used uh, usually on their body. They are daily paintings 
that uh, represent many things that they can see in nature or they can feel in nature. So the forms may uh, relate to, to animals like the armadillo, the tattoo, the jacaré, the alligator, or many different types of fishes, and, uh, or even the passage of time with uh, rituals or moments of life, like uh, the puberty or pregnancy or the painting of related to life and death. And uh, the idea of authorship for the Kayapo community is also not something that exists. Those drawings or these patterns or these vibrations, they somehow are passed from generation to generation and individually they are uh, manifested, but actually no one exactly owns it. The idea of possession is pretty relative. So the body, the body drawings, they are also super ephemeral because they fade away within a few days and they are made of uh, Jenny Papo ink, which is a fruit that lasts on, on, the, screen, on the skin for a, a few days. And um, for me, when I approached to the two drawings, the, the propositions by Solowit and, and, uh, and uh, Kaipo women, it was pretty striking. But again, uh, when, I, when, I, when I came to the Kayapa women, I did one proposition that instead of placing, of drawing in their own, own body those patterns, they could, uh, they could apply it to historical maps of their territory. The, uh, in the past government in Brazil, the, there was a huge struggle on territory. The um, human rights were completely challenged and there was a huge threat of taking indigenous lands uh, to be reconsidered in their own historical protection. Uh, this was one of the many nightmares that we've been through. And uh, these this proposition was done in this uh, historical context. So I went to, to, the, to the Kayapo women of the Aldeia Pucanu in the territory of Mekranyoti. And those drawings of a map, they look totally abstract to them. They make no sense. They have names and representations of a river and representations of hills. And I, I invited them that that document could be, be, be taken as a platform and as a, as a materiality for their drawings. So instead of having the body as the territory, they started applying those uh, uh, traditional patterns on the maps. And while doing so, the map started kind of fading away, of disappearing. The information kind of loses its meanings. And uh, instead, the, the patterns of Kayapo start being by the front of it. And, they, and totally ignoring the, the red line that shows the limit that was possible within colonization and the, and the colonial past of Brazil, his, Brazilian history. And when we see it from a distance, what stands out is that uh, a, a graphism that vibrates, vibrates a sort of a manifesto. And uh, when I approach the two works, first solo wits propositions that also remind my own personal propositions as an artist as, and how I somehow engaged with conceptual art and the propositions by, and the manifestations of drawings by Kayapa women that relates to textures in nature, leaves, animals, and so on, they somehow relate, but not. And some, some questions uh, showed up in my head, like, what is the nature 
that motivate Sky Pop Me paintings? What nature motivates Louis's paintings? What force are the Kaiapo lines obeying? What force are Louis's lines obeying? As Louis's lines are guided by the idea of proposition, are they more rational? As the Kaiapo women uh, drawings respond to manifestations of nature and its vibration that takes their own body as a continuity of bodies that live in the forest, do they respond to a certain spiritual force? As the idea of art is so conceptually Western uh, that the Kayapov lines as a manifestation of nature, they, do they deserve a historiography of their own elaborated by themselves and uh, that may redesign the very understanding and function, the understanding and function of art, and even, and even if the name art makes sense to themselves. As Lewitt proposes guidance by the idea of a proposition or an instruction, would his lines be more rational? As Kayapo people respond to the vibration of nature, are they more spiritual? Can, uh, do these lines represent abstractions, both of them, or not? Or are they two different types of abstraction? Can we think of, a, of the line as a connector of points, or a line that separates uh, parts, or serves as a sort of a border? Um, So, thinking that, um, that uh, the Kayapo drawings and the mani are manifested with lines, and, and the lines uh, take their own body, so the body is the presence of these, of these graphisms and these, of these drawings, and, uh, and, the, and Lewitt's propositions are straightforward directions on how to, to have a drawing manifested, I've thought of, a, of, of proposing you a, a drawing together here as a proposition of one minute. So the rule is simple. I'll kind of combine the proposition of, of having a proposition <laughs> of uh, of, uh, of, of solo wit by, uh, by the presence of our own body. Whoever wants to participate, <laughs> so I, I propose that we use this red line here to do a drawing of one minute. So, I'll start with Matilde. <laughs> and uh, when, the, when the timer starts, whoever who raises the hand and I make the eye contact, I will go with the line above the heads and, we, uh, and it's the person will hold another part of the line. Then I, when I look and I make eye contact to another person who raises the hand, I will continue to that point until we reach one minute, or if the ribbon finishes. <laughs> Shall we? Okay. Max, hold. <laughs> okay. Now.
Shall we try again? <laughs> Not sure if I do it faster or one minute or two minutes we try. We had plenty of, I think we had many participants, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, let's try two minutes now and then we are done. Max, can we? Okay, whoever, who wants to start? I'll start with you. No. Okay, that was very nice, thank you. <laughs> Hold on. A <laughs> marathon. <laughs> well, thank you very much for joining, but <laughs> let me tell you a little bit more about the Kayapo women and who they are. Uh, so these are the Kayapo women, some of them. This is, this is Kokowati and Greyboy. This is Nyako and Papoy. And this is Bequiquet e Irekanti. And uh, there you can see their body paintings happening in daily life, it was f the first time I, I met an indigenous community that, that didn't speak Brazilian Portuguese, the language that we were taught by the Portuguese. And uh, for me, it was, was very radical and fascinating to see a community living apart from the project of colonization and how Brazilian developed in so many radical issues that we still today need to figure out. And uh, uh, it was very impressive to photograph these women. And while I was doing the portraits, I noticed that the behavior that us in the Western culture have with the camera, they completely have another, had, had another relation with the device, the, the camera itself or the cell phone. While when we pull up the phone to photograph someone, I, we, we, we behave, we kind of are over aware of that presence. The Kayapa women, they just, when they agreed to be photographed, like here, they were just there, present. They would just look at the camera or not look at the camera. They were like, just like looking at me, trying to interact or perform. And there is uh, a very strong gaze of these unarmed behavior in front of a camera. 
and uh, they live in the in these traditional housings that are communal and uh, and again they are in the south of uh, of uh, of uh, Para. This is the aldea Pucanu. These are the, the traditional maps with the, the with the help of the of a translator from someone of the of the community. I explain what they are and what these maps were about and what my proposition was. They embraced it and I brought them with this red line that is a line that makes curves, not only uh, straight lines, and it means the limits of their own territory. And it was beautiful to see that that meant somehow nothing, anything to them, and the idea of the patterns going across that boundary was something super powerful to me. And the idea that I had initially of, of these propositions that I had in mind started to take form by that experience. And the names and the names of the territories, of the rivers, of the hills, or where mining was, was possible with the presence of, uh, of, uh, of metal or, 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 or valuable materials could be covered by those lines. It's important to say that the past government in Brazil facilitated uh, illegal mining inside uh, indigenous territories. And the access to health was very difficult, to, to health and medicine. And uh, I decided to photograph not not their faces exactly as a, a shareable artwork, but their hands. Because I, uh, for me it was very beautiful, the idea that the, the individual gesture represents a gesture of a collective. So they paint with, with sticks, and uh, those sticks are the, are the tools. And, uh, and, and for me, the, the presence of the hand in real, in real size was a, a physical presence of their resistance as a gesture. So in this group of photographs, we see the 30 participants standing up and their names. But also for me, it's very beautiful that although agency and authorship is starting, it started to be uh, discussed in, in, uh, in the community. It's very beautiful that they stand that with the idea that no one owns the drawing, but the drawing is passed from an older to a younger one and from generation to generation. Here we can see the arm of the, the, the woman painter who painted the, the piece of, uh, of map on the side. So for me, uh, bringing these two types of drawing, Lewitt's propositions and the Kaipo propositions and the Kaipo manifestations of drawings, tell me that the paths of a line can be varied and the manifestation of these lines can also uh, instigate and, uh, and can, can, can vibrate different things completely. And I think uh, they can, work as, as greeds, as connectors, as separators, as border makers, as uh, sensory abstractions that vibrate in, in our own nature. So, may, so I think that the vibrations and the strength of Lewitt's uh, patterns and the, Kayapo, and the Kayapo graphisms can teach us a little bit of resistance. So thank you very much.